Hello Internet, I'm Jackie Fox, and what follows is a series of recordings made in the Visions classroom, specifically the lecture hall, on my Discord, the Foxhole, which is, in addition to many other things, a, a cool place to hang out even for non-Wotive-related reasons. Um, it also contains a War of the Visions classroom. Hello Internet, I'm Jackie Fox, and we're going to be continuing our video series on the ty basic types of combat here today with guild versus guild battles. Um, so we're going to talk about offense first. I've got some folks in the classroom with me here today who are going to help me out. But let me give you kind of the basics on offense. You're going to want to build specific and probably pretty aggressive. Um, if you can get, say... Um, defense across the board high or a particular elemental resistance particularly high or maybe you have a particular set of buffs or TMRs that really help uh, by stacking certain things that you might find on a particular team then you can face that team really effectively and that's kind of what you're looking for now just because a team can beat another team in theory doesn't really mean much if you aren't seeing it on defense so this is going to be really dependent on where you are and as you can see, just another concept that I want to throw out here that's really prominent in high tier, because this is probably like a top 20 guild that we're facing, unfortunately for us, is the idea of a wall. It doesn't necessarily have to be the strongest thing in the game to work. Like, this could work really well in lower tiers with just whatever element your guild has on hand, because the theory is that they're only going to have so many offensive teams that can deal with it, and if it's a half-decent build, that you guys have across the team, they're eventually going to run out of people who can handle it effectively, and then they're going to start to suffer. And as you can see, this has been a really effective strategy against us, even though we're in Ares too. Um, also, really good for taking out Earth, not so good against Dark, as I just found out. So what you want to run on offense is going to be really dependent not only on what's running on defense, but also what other people in your guild are running, um, and what they use it against like a lot of the other wind players in my guild have just been long time wind players and they've they've tuned their teams to deal with things like light evasion or i don't know different things i don't know that much i'm not that much of a wind player i like to play it on defense where i don't have to think about what it's doing um but my point is that a lot of the other wind teams in my guild deal with other things and don't even really go for the earth team so usually they're left over for me and if you're not really sure what's going to be left over, try looking through your guild battle records and you can kind of get a sense of like who... 68, okay, that, oh no, wait, we got 85. I looked at the wrong side. Let me find one where we left some stuff unconquered. Yeah, okay. Well, it's not a really good example, but yeah. We left a dark team. I guess that's to be expected. Dark is kind of in a cool place right now with Sephiroth. I think this map kind of helps him a bit, but not not a ton. It's not like he's super weak to magic or anything, but the spirit helps him a lot in particular. <clears throat> uh, another thing that's going to be a lot more helpful across the board in Guild versus Guild is going to be skills that have multiple casts. In a lot of other formats, this is a best of one fight. Um, in guild versus guild offense, this is best of two, essentially. Hopefully you get to that second fight. Um, in defense, it's practically infinite, but like, or it's potentially infinite, but like practically five or six. Eventually you're just gonna run out of skills, honestly. You're gonna run out of AP, TP, skill use, everything. You're just gonna be normal swinging on everybody. And if you're still winning at that point, like, good on you or bad on the opponent, I'm not really sure how to put it. Um, but as you can see with this one where we had a lot of trouble, it seems like the commonality is that we're having trouble dealing with the sudden influx of dark. Which I think is probably a common story for a lot of people and why we're going to start seeing a lot more dark on defense. Um, but, uh, maybe that means that I should start hunting dark, and believe me, I'm already thinking about it, so, we'll get there. <laughs> but, um, the reason that I say this is because there's a lot of units that their survivability or how well they do in battle is kind of dependent on getting that skill off. And that skill could be something like Courage, or Re-Raise, or even their Limit Break, which are often capped at only one use. So, if you've got a unit that just has a, like, 
Medinia would be such a great example if they never upgraded her flair, but even with her flair, she's she's really like stretching for options after she goes past her limit break, I think. I don't know. Maybe they gave her an upgraded Blizzaga. I'm I'm anyways. She does significantly worse in fight 2 because she doesn't have her limit break and that's kind of like her defining thing. Now Sephiroth has an amazing limit break. He may not be as good at removing re-raise or courage in fight two, but he does have other guaranteed hit. He does have a lot of other powerful stuff. He'll be fine in fight two, even though he can't reuse that limit break. But let's say like Elena, she's typically a little bit less safe in fight two in guild battle because she can't use that courage again, or she didn't use it in the first fight. And then she's, I don't know. That's probably not ideal. Um, in terms of sustain, you want a little bit. You don't have to go all the way into the sustain trio of tank, DPS, healer. I tend to find healers and supports come in and out of the meta, depending on just how much damage is going around and how fast. But tanks can be really helpful, especially if you have uh, like a DPS that's particularly prone to getting one shot. I know a lot of people have a cloud out there and you'll know, especially like a cloud versus cloud matchup, is often defined by who deals damage first. They're getting, they're one-shotting each other. Um, so if you can take a unit like that and have a distraction with a tank and your game doesn't crash, then you will, well, even if your game crashes, you know, the fight happens instantly, you'll still win, you know what I mean? Even if the game crashes, you'll just have to find out about it after you come back. This might be a good time to, uh, to get some comments from the class on offense and how you build your teams. Maybe not super detailed, but just practically, or maybe even better, uh, how you pick who you go up against based on what your team does. That's probably better. Definitely. Um, I'm Caveman. I'm a sub leader for both uh, for two of our guilds. Um, that's in our group. And for the most part, I like to uh, since my team is fire evasion. I try to look for teams that I know have really poor accuracy, or they don't have a whole lot of offense because um, casters usually take time to cast their magic which means you can usually rush them mm. and just beat them down mm -hmm. um, so I tend to target a lot of magic based units and I also tend to target a lot of lightning teams which that's actually starting to get a little less frequent Yeah. but with the queen of fire yuffie as she's being called and and your guild i, I mean uh i'm sorry your your fire team is also very rushy which i think is a characteristic yes. that is both like important to define but also not one that people really talk about because like they no, get in your face no. and combo on you very fast and like yes. this type of team being popular is one of the the things in the meta that knocks healers out i think because that healer is a caster most of the time or they're too offensive to like you know, or they're arithmetician and they they're they're spamming their attacks, um, or they're casting them. So your team just like you know the caster starts doing it and you've already finished them off before it even lands. Yep. So I run generally, especially with the limited battles we're doing right now. I know a lot of people are are talking up Naya, but my God, Min Wu. Yeah. Min Wu on this map is a amazing well the reason people are uh, talking up naya is kind of the same reason that i think little leela is popular it's just it's insane. so easy to get an insane i reincarnated my little leela 20 times oh i did that with naya my naya has been reincarnated 20 times as well wow and let me tell yeah. you she is a hell of a healer now um she is the cookie cutter healer yeah this would be like the tank healer dps i haven't really used this in a while or a little while, but it is really good because she makes both of these units very survivable. <laughs> it's, it's a shame she doesn't get more courage procs, because that definitely helps him a lot. He has double courage, um, which makes him really good in guild versus guild battles. Yeah, so. I, I only recently built her out. I was using Sylvie. I think I still may like Sylvie better on this, only because of, like, full life and raise. Just because... Skahal is still really fragile. <laughs> like, two, he dies to any two hits in a row. Any two hits, pretty much. So, uh, being able to bring him back to life, I think, might be more impactful. But I, I might as well at least try it. I accidentally made two Buster Swords. 
Uh, yeah, this is the level 36 one. Cool. <laughs> I mean, having two of the same sword is, as long as they're different types, does give you, like, oh, hey, I'm going to experiment with Cloud it, and... Yeah, with certain let, ones. Let's go critical instead of Assault. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say that basically the only four that you should usually build in most cases for weapons is Assault, Magic, Critical, or Aim. And you have to be getting a good critical or aim to really be able to make it worth it. Maps. We got short maps. Those can be kind of an issue for gunners. Uh, they can be maybe an issue for longer range units sometimes. Um, longer range mages, though, actually do pretty well on short maps. Because they don't, they aren't as buff reliant to set up their AP. Um, I remember there was this is this was like two years ago, um, but there was a map where Sakura could LB right off the bat, and pretty much the only thing, and and she was the fastest unit on the field like nine tenths of the fights too if you built her right. So she it, it's not that she would take out the whole team, but they were starting with two units, maybe half health on the other ones. She still had terrible accuracy, so she missed a lot, but um. Mages actually can work really well on short maps because they don't need the setup. Gunners are a little bit worse on short maps because people can get to them faster. But if you have really, really fast gunners um, and you can just lay in damage really quickly, you probably want a third unit with a setup buff that can get in between them and a map that they're that close together or your setup buff is that wide. Um, so they get a little bit of setup, maybe turn off their other moves or make them a short range unit. Um, but yeah, you can do really, really crazy stuff with gunners on short maps. You just have to set up a lot more for it. Typical gunner builds don't work the same way on short maps. Then you got your mid-range maps. Um, so those can actually be really helpful for rush builds. Kind of like what we were talking about with cavemans. Um, and especially with like Yuffie in some cases. And the reason I don't bring this up as much on short maps is because sometimes this causes them to rush in without their buffs. Like with Yuffie, no Brumal Form means no guaranteed hit evasion, and a lot of other buffs that she gets. I think she gets like Slash Attack Evasion and maybe Unit Attack Resistance, but a lot off of that buff. So mid-range maps are usually the ones that give them just enough time to get one buff off, but probably catch the opponents while they're still setting up, while they're still clumped. You can come in with AoEs and just wreck them before they even have a chance to get off the buffs that they were expecting to go into battle with. And that can really, um, especially if one of those units that's rushing out is, uh, well, I mean, maybe specifically Celeste because she's fast and has initial hate like that. Um, you can also throw off their formations, their buff pattern. If you can just get hate close to them fast enough on a mid-range map or even a short map um, where initial hate might affect them from the very beginning, even before you've moved. And then you have particularly long maps. If they're flat, this really favors gunners because they can set up and then shoot and get maybe two or three turns to just rain hell on opponents before they're possibly countered. That can be really good for them. Um, but gunners can have an issue with shooting through things and shooting up or down. They can only shoot directly in front of them most of the times. Um, and those problems are mostly addressed by archers who actually have an advantage on variable height maps, especially if they can play King of the Hill and get some extra range, especially shooting at units that are below them. And that can make them really powerful. Especially if that hill is like in the center of the map. I've seen places where somebody like Cloud here on the screen um, has been able to get to the top of the hill and barrage any part of the map from there. And that's obviously pretty powerful. Um, also for height variable maps, you got arithmeticians can really shoot up or down really well with a lot of their big AOE moves. So they can be really helpful if you've got mountains or canyons or hills or whatever that people are having trouble with. And then uh, with height variable maps as well, having higher jump uh, like ninjas or dragoons, that can be really be beneficial as well. Some archers have this too. But like, yeah, you can go in and what, what I recommend is turning auto off but not necessarily doing the initial placement like leave your units in the same place as they would be and then move them the way that you want them to move to get the buffs off that you want them to get off and if they can't do that or you notice that you know they're doing something else when you put them in auto turn that off or move them so that they can do the thing you want them to do uh so yeah this is kind of what we were talking about with this map it's not super wide it's fairly wide, 
but there's kind of choke points like this isn't all on ramp you need two jump to get up here you need three to get up here but otherwise if you're on the wings you've got to go way over to the side and up um to get into it but again two jump can get you up here but most people are going to get bunched up in the middle and come in this way which effectively means that for two of your units they're moving inwards probably or they're kind of moving off awkwardly to the side and really Unless you're facing down like missile that's really going to punish you early, you probably want your units to group up and buff early because it's also going to give them agility bonuses, which is going to help you get your buffs off faster than your opponent and maybe get into position to start doing damage earlier. Okay, well, that being said, we're going into defense. So for defense, there's a number of things to do. Um, up until like the, the highest, highest ranks, people who really put a lot of effort into these things, you can get away with bait teams and the most typical type of bait team and you can put more and more thought into it than this because there's a lot of levels on which metas and, and you know counters exist um, but you, usually you would see elemental so let's say I have a lightning unit up front um, let's say it's Charlotte specifically she's weak to Pierce so it's also weak to Earth she's weak to Oberon right so I want the other two units behind her to be wind and uh, maybe give them like an elf's cloak, which is going to give them additional pierce resistance. Um, maybe pick wind units that have good pierce resistance. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but basically, you want to bait them into saying, you want to bait an Oberon player, someone who's playing Oberon on offense, to saying, oh yes, I can handle that tank very easily. I would love to take on this team. Um, it probably also helps if they are uh, physical wind units because most earth teams have a lot of defense. So they're going to be looking for teams with a lot of attack to attack. And you can kind of play into that uh, a little bit. So really, this is the most meta form of gameplay in that you are metagaming in the most literal sense. You are trying to figure out what the other player is trying to play. And then you're playing something to counter their play without them noticing that you're countering their play. And again, you can get further into that if you want. Um, you could, uh, I don't know, take a unit that's ridiculously weak to magic and then put a, uh, like, I don't know, maybe Esther is a good example of this. Or maybe like Ingelbert, although that would be more double tanking than... Um, but, but put like uh, Celeste behind them who can guard them with a runic shield and make their weakness to magic a little bit more irrelevant. Because then they're going to be able to do what they do a lot better. And the magic teams that are going to be like, oh, I can handle an Esther. I can handle an Ingelbert. Are going to find out that they can if they're not being covered by a Celeste. So really, you'll want to be foxy on defense. Um, you also want to be kind of general. You don't want to build too much for one thing or too much for the other. You want to be a little bit more of a jack of all trades. Now, this doesn't mean that you want to necessarily push units in directions they weren't meant to go. Um, if your unit is meant to be an evasion unit and you want to run them on defense, you probably shouldn't run them first slot because people are going to realize that they should bring evasion counters, first of all. Um, but the second thing with evasion is you still want to lean into their evasion. You don't want to moderate that by... You know, overthinking the fact that somebody might come in with guaranteed hit, just don't put them in the first slot and hope that the best comes of it. Um, but for other units, like let's say Charlotte, who has a lot of stuff to help her uh, with magic in her kit, she has a counter that raises her spirit, maybe you could build her more for defense, or maybe build her for something more general, like slash attack resistance, which is going to affect a lot of magic units as well, like Elena, although with Elena being less and less powerful, there are less magic slash units in the game that are super relevant. Um, but that's a way of thinking about it. Make your tank more general instead of, say, your offensive Charlotte. For your offensive Charlotte, I would recommend leaning into spirit as far as you can. Try to get that to 100 with buffs, um, magic attack resistance all the way, and then attack mages. But your defensive Charlotte is going to be a build where you're arguably trying to have more defense than Spirit because some of her buffs and stuff that she can do to herself is going to raise her resistance to magic naturally, which is going to mean that she's coming into a fight as a very versatile tank. And there's a lot of tanks that are good for this reason on defense that wouldn't be as good on offense. You just kind of have to build them right. 
I mean, another good example of that is taking a Celeste and building her as far into defense and physical resistances as you can, assuming that most of the magic attacks and spirit based scaling attacks are going to be uh, reflected or absorbed by Runic Blade. So that makes her an incredible uh, tank on defense, in addition to her screwing with AI, enemy AI, in the way that I described earlier, which can make all of their best laid plans just fall apart. We've already talked about walls in this video. That is a part of defense. Again, it's an effective strategy, even if you don't have the most meta team. Again, a lot of these high ranking guilds are kind of wailing out to get all of the best stuff, or they're saving very specifically for it if they're not wailing. Um, and, you know, they have a very good handle on what the absolute best statistical units are in the game and what the most uncounterable ones are, most importantly. Um, and they run that. But that doesn't mean that that strategy isn't effective if you don't have the best units. Again, uh, something that might be more attainable for people is a light evasion wall. Yes, most guilds are going to run a number of evasion counters, but once they run out of that, what are the rest of the guild going to do, right? So maybe they get, maybe they have uh, 10 teams out of their 30 that are evasion counters. Maybe they can get 30 stars off of you easy. Okay, what about the next 60 though? See, that's the power of a wall team, even if it's not the most meta team or even the most meta strategy. Just having enough of it and being overwhelming can be a very powerful thing. Now, when I was saying that the sustained triangle wasn't necessarily important on offense, it's a lot more important on defense. Again, sometimes healers might not be as important on that. However, they more often find a home on defensive teams than they would on offensive teams. And that's because, again, th th theoretically, your defensive team might be taking like five matches if it does particularly well. So you want to be able to survive and keep surviving and keep surviving. So you want a good healer in a lot of cases, especially if you're being so ambitious as to try to get five defense in one night, which might not be the right thing to aim for, but hey, it's a thing. This is also a case where... Um, having two or more casts is really important just like in offense except that it goes even more here because again you could go into match three you could go into match four so you know how how much worse is your team going to perform by match four when they've run out of their good options that's a question you might want to ask yourself on defense where it's not going to be as important on offense so tank dps healer is is pretty good most of the time not always the best um not always the most perfect meta thing um but one thing that is almost always terrible is oops all tanks which is just three tanks just it's defense these these units are defensive i i get it it makes a lot of sense it feels like a noob mistake that people make all throughout the rankings but here's the thing that actually happens they don't have enough power to stop units, those units keep hitting them very hard, and since they can't do anything about that offensively, they eventually run out of their defensive sustaining capabilities, and again, usually these teams don't have any sort of a supporting mage to heal them, so when they take that damage, they take that damage. It doesn't, you know, they, they don't really have heals. Um, so generally speaking, oops, all tanks doesn't win against anything. It's a terrible build. Don't do it. What is probably a lot better is maybe two tanks, potentially. Um, maybe like a, a main tank and a pseudo tank that can maybe draw some fire a little bit later in the game to give your healer time to heal your other tank or something like a late game distraction type of thing um you really have to think about the range of their moves and when they're going to use them in the fight to pull that off what's probably even better than that um is two brawlers maybe two brawlers in a support two brawlers in a tank something like that uh but you want to be able to do damage you need at least one unit that is some degree of dps on your defensive team because even your defense needs a certain amount of offense. And with all of that being said, I think I'm about done, except to add one additional reflection to this, and that is that there are a lot of units that have heals that do not particularly have the AI to use said heals, because they primarily focus on doing damage when they're in range. 
which creates a scenario where you can have a unit that's primarily DPS or primarily damage or just not a support or a healer in general. But going into round two, their AI, because they're not near any opponents, will choose, uh, will, will cause them to choose uh, to heal whoever is closest to them, which can be a real boon. Um, I like to do this a lot with White Mage Kilfay. Again, she doesn't heal in battle, but she will restore one unit to full health uh, as soon as your second battle starts, and that can be a big help. If you have a mage or say you aren't running anyone with healing capabilities at all, one thing that you can do is throw on Masheri's TMR. That's not only going to be a great heal to get two units or maybe even three back to full health, but you're also going to be throwing a barrier on them as well. So that's that's a pretty great way to start round two. And in fact, that may even be a stronger start to round two than whatever your buffs were for round one, because that's a good barrier. And... Man, after waking up this morning and checking my notifications, I really don't want to use Reddit anymore. Like, I come to this conclusion, pretty much every post, every other post, as soon as someone says something really rude or mean, uh, the kind of thing that a person wouldn't say to your face, you know, just... The internet really fosters that to begin with, but I feel like Reddit especially is a bit of a crab pot. I mean, it's a great place to get answers if you have very specific questions. There's usually a post about it, but boy, I I actually have a little bit of trauma whenever I see a Reddit notification. It, it sometimes takes me days to actually like build up the will to actually check them and maybe answer someone. So if you're trying to uh, talk to me on one of my Reddit posts, it's probably not going to happen, at least not very fast. Um, so there's a lot of other options. Please like and subscribe to the channel. That would really help me out. Even if you're just liking the video, that's going to help me get seen by more people on YouTube so I don't have to post on Reddit and maybe I'll go to other social media plat. I really don't want to get back into to Facebook. That's just such a time suck. And then there's all the other ones and... <sighs> I guess what I'm saying is that the less time that I spend having to promote myself, probably the better, and the more time that I can spend making content. And hopefully you would rather me be spending my time making content than spending my time trying to figure out how to sell myself online, which, uh, yeah, that feels as disgusting to say as it feels to think as well. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so like, subscribe, share, comment in the comments even if you're just saying hey i hope you do better in the algorithm because i left this comment because yeah that actually will help me in the algorithm and i'll probably comment back like yeah i hope so too just to get another comment in there because hey this is the kind of shenanigans that small channels have to get up to to actually get promoted by the youtube algorithm it's some real big pick me pick me energy but hey i'm a small channel that's what i've got to do so if you could help me out with that so that i spend less time selling myself online Ooh, my soul would fucking thank you. So, if that's the kind of thing you're into, hopefully I will have more time to finish this series. I still have a video on the various uh, PvE formats, talking about stuff like uh, raids, or, say, brutal difficulty content. There's all sorts of uh, things that just work a lot better in PvE, and there's actually some things that work a lot uh, worse in PvE, as a matter of fact. So, you know, really interesting how some strategies only work for PvP. And then we have the other PvP formats that are based in the dual arena, such as the arena format, which is way different than guild battle honestly it's it's way different than guild battle offense or defense even though it does share some of the same meta and then you have stuff like class match or quick pick um which is even wilder and has some really in-depth nuanced uh ways that you can play and those are also the formats that allow manual play which i just absolutely love and and if you're still listening this far after the end of the video, maybe you would like to join the server, link in the description. Um, one of the things that I am hoping to organize as I get some more people in there is maybe some sort of a, maybe a tournament that might be able to take place, at least in part in manual. 
Um, I guess there will be kind of a competitive agreement between players at the beginning of a fight, whether they're going to be doing it in manual or auto or, you know, what's acceptable in that fight, because some people will have their preferences of how they like to go into things. But personally, I think manual on manual duels are just really amazing and intense and really fun to watch. Um, and just like the the pinnacle of this game in a way that I would like to expose more people to. So, man, being able to like do some RNJ commentary on your, uh, you know, help help me make content by doing doing the matches for me and just let me do the commentary. That would be great. Um, I would really enjoy just being an announcer for a world of tournament so maybe we can get that started but it's going to take more people on the server so go ahead and join up and hopefully we'll be able to get enough people to do stuff like that soon. Anyways my next couple videos are going to be on the next couple of formats I've probably already mentioned that so with all that being said see ya in the next one.